Welcome to Coffee Break PD. In this series, we explore some basics about the Bitcoin blockchain. In this session, we will look at how it resolved the double spending problem, understand how hashing functions and cover other fundamentals. Let's get started. Let's look at some key ideas related to Bitcoin. An important point to note is that Bitcoin was not the first attempt at digital currency. There were predecessors. The cypherpunk movement, which advocated using cryptography to affect cultural and political change, is one such example. Julian Assange, a prominent figure in this movement, is known for his journalism that challenges power structures. He is currently imprisoned in the UK, fighting extradition to the US for his work on WikiLeaks. Another member of the cypherpunk movement, David Chaum, launched DigiCash. Although the currency enabled anonymity, it ran into the double spend problem. This problem is crucial to understand when studying the innovation of blockchain. With DigiCash, it was possible for Bob to send the digital currency to Alice and Sally simultaneously. This is the double spend problem as Bob copies and pastes money into both Alice and Sally's accounts, thereby defrauding DigiCash. Chom's solution to the double spend problem was to work with banks. This was problematic for two reasons. Firstly, it was anti-cypherpunk because it required working with banks. Secondly, it did not allow for a decentralized approach to digital currency because it relied on a centralized intermediary to ensure that fraud did not take place. In other words, it took everyone back to square one. 2008, Bitcoin was introduced, followed by a white paper by Satoshi Nakamoto. This figure remains mysterious because, to this day, no one knows who Satoshi Nakamoto is. Real-life individuals like Hal Finney and Andreessen Horowitz have interacted with this person or group. Nakamoto possesses approximately 1 million bitcoins that remain in a wallet, untouched. As a result, no one has been able to locate Nakamoto, as he has left no digital footprints that would allow others to track him down. Before moving forward, it is important to state that bitcoin's main innovation was solving the double spend problem. That's it. Though there are a number of features to the technology, it really comes to this single issue which it solved. Bitcoin's system takes approximately 10 minutes to confirm a transaction to ensure it hasn't been spent previously. This solves the problem of transferring value over the internet without an intermediary. In other words, Bitcoin's protocol operates in a fully decentralized manner. This is unlike DigiCash's approach to the double spend problem that involved using banks as the centralized intermediary. Blockchain redefines trust in the digital age. Traditionally, trust was established through institutions like banks. In blockchain, trust is established through cryptography. This means transactions and data are secured and verified using mathematical proofs instead of relying on a centralized intermediary. Each transaction is encrypted and linked to the previous one, creating a chain that is virtually tamper-proof. This cryptographic trust is a fundamental shift from institution-based trust to algorithm-based trust. However, it's worth noting that blockchain technology as utilized in platforms like Bitcoin is often heralded as fostering a trustless environment. This term, though, doesn't imply a complete absence of trust. Rather, it signifies a shift in the focus of trust, from centralized institutions to the decentralized blockchain network and its underlying encryption algorithms. In this context, trustless means that users rely on the system's inherent mechanisms, algorithmic consensus, and cryptographic security, instead of placing trust in a single authoritative entity. Although Bitcoin is often depicted as a metal coin, this representation does not accurately reflect the protocol. In reality, there are no virtual or physical coins. That is, no block of code is being transferred between two different wallets. Instead, the balance of a person's Bitcoin is the net sum of the transactions in and out of their wallet. For example, if Alice receives 10 Bitcoins and spends 4, Alice's balance is 6 Bitcoins. Thus, the amount of Bitcoin a person owns is calculated by taking into account all the transactions they have carried out to arrive at their net balance. As Bitcoin is decentralized, it leverages a peer-to-peer -peer ledger. Similar to Napster and BitTorrent, there is no central server. Instead, the ledger exists on personal devices such as your laptop. You act as a client and a peer within this network. The way it works is that your ledger is connected to ledgers on other people's laptops, desktops, or any computing devices they are using. There are also miners who work to ensure the system's integrity, which is done in consensus with the entire network. Let's delve into understanding consensus within the Bitcoin network. Miners use the proof-of-work protocol, expending a significant amount of electricity to process and confirm transactions 
which are then compiled into a new block on the blockchain. Miners, however, can't simply add a block to the blockchain on their own. They need the network's approval. If over half of the network, that is 51% or more, agrees on a block, it gets added to the blockchain and the miner gets paid in Bitcoin. On the flip side, if more than half disagrees with the block the miner proposes, the network rejects it and they spent all that money on electricity for nothing. In the blockchain, each transaction undergoes a rigorous validation process. Miners collect transactions into a block, solve a complex mathematical puzzle to validate it, and then seek network consensus for the block's addition. This decentralized process ensures the integrity of the blockchain. As we delve into the intricacies of blockchain technology, we must address one of its most significant challenges. Scalability. The blockchain is a growing list of records. Blocks. Linked using cryptography. Each block contains a number of transactions that are verified and added to the blockchain by miners. However, as the blockchain expands with every added block, the demands on storage and processing power escalate. The very nature of blockchain security, every transaction is recorded and confirmed across a distributed network, means that more transactions lead to a larger ledger. And as this ledger grows, the resources needed to maintain and validate it increase. This growth has real-world implications, such as slower transaction times and higher costs, which can hinder the technology's ability to scale and serve a global user base. Moreover, every transaction needs to be processed by the network. With the current proof-of-work mechanism that underlies networks like Bitcoin, this processing involves complex mathematical computations, which are both time and energy intensive. As more transactions are added to the queue, the time to process each one can increase, leading to potential bottlenecks. Solutions such as the Lightning Network exist to alleviate the issue, but they are beyond the scope of this discussion. Another aspect to understand is how blockchain uniquely organizes transactional data. Unlike spreadsheets where data is organized in rows and columns, blockchain organizes data into blocks that are sequentially stacked. Take a look at the blockchain diagram before you. Each block within this chain is securely linked to the following one through cryptographic hashes. It's a design that ensures each block is mathematically tethered to its successor. For instance, as shown here, block 10 is cryptographically connected to block 11, which is in turn linked to block 12. To change the information in block 10, you would also need to modify the cryptographic hashes in blocks 11 and 12. This chain structure is what safeguards against tampering, as altering a single block is insufficient. All subsequent blocks must also be changed. Now, let's delve deeper into the concept of cryptographic hashing, also known as hashing. A hash algorithm turns an arbitrarily large amount of data into a fixed length hash. For example, a simple hash function to control employee authorization would be to take the list of authorized employee numbers, add them up, and divide by the total number of employees to come up with a new number, the hash. This hash has no meaning other than being a useful control over the list of employees. If a fictitious employee were added to the payroll list, the payroll system would calculate the hash before processing the pay and would find that it did not match the authorized hash and would signal an attempted control breach. This is just a simple example. In actuality, hash algorithms are more complex to avoid duplicates and so on. The goal of a hash algorithm is for the same unique hash to result from the same data, but modifying the data by even one bit should completely change the hash. In this illustration, the transformation is carried out by a hash function. In this case, SHA-256, a commonly used algorithm. Now consider the text block on your left. It represents a piece of text, for instance, a financial statement mentioning revenue as a critical measure for investors. When we apply the SHA-256 hash function to this text, it produces a unique hash code, as you see below the text. This code acts like a digital fingerprint. Even a minuscule change to the original data, such as removing a period, results in a dramatically different hash code, as shown on the right side of the slide. This characteristic is what makes hashing so powerful for security. If data were altered, the discrepancy in hash codes would be immediate and evident. There's no relationship between the two hashes. The use of hashes is akin to reconciling a control total. If the numbers don't add up, something's amiss. In blockchain technology, such data integrity measures are fundamental to ensuring that each block of data is authentic and unaltered, maintaining trust in the system. 
the beauty of SHA-256, lies in its two key properties. First, it's deterministic, meaning the same input will always produce the same hash. And second, it's practically infeasible to reverse engineer the input from its hash. SHA-256 was chosen for Bitcoin due to its robust security features. It's resistant to hash collisions, meaning it's highly unlikely two different inputs will produce the same hash. This is crucial for preventing fraudulent transactions. Additionally, its computational complexity makes it ideal for the mining process, balancing the need for security with practical computational demands. While SHA-256 is a cornerstone in Bitcoin, its applications extend beyond. It's widely used in securing software downloads, like verifying the integrity of a file. This universal application underlines its reliability and security, reinforcing why it was chosen for Bitcoin's complex and high-stakes environment. Hashing is not unique to blockchain and was in use long before the arrival of Bitcoin. The image showcases the use of Audacity's software checksum, which is a real-world example of SHA-256 hashing in action. When you download a program like Audacity, you can verify that the file has not been tampered with by checking its hash value. The hash value is a unique identifier for the file's contents. On the left, you see the official hash value the Audacity website provides. On the right, we have the calculated hash value after downloading the file. Using the online hash calculator as demonstrated, we can drop the downloaded file into the calculator, which will generate a hash value for that file. Now, notice the two hash values. If they match, it confirms that the file is authentic and unchanged from its original state. This is how hashing is crucial for maintaining the security of data transmission over the internet. It's a simple yet effective way to protect against malicious alterations, ensuring that the software you download is exactly what the provider intended to distribute. Simplified Payment Verification, or SPV, is a method that allows users, especially on mobile devices with limited storage, to verify transactions without the need to download the entire blockchain, which is over 500 gigabytes in size. The diagram you see illustrates how SPV utilizes mathematical relationships within the structure of a blockchain. It relies on the Merkle root, which is a composite hash of all the underlying transactions, and as you can see in the diagram, SPV allows users to confirm transactions by leveraging the mathematical properties of Merkle trees. Let's break down this process. A Merkle tree is a structure that contains every transaction as a leaf node at the bottom. The hash of each transaction, like hash TXA for transaction A as seen on the left, is computed. These transaction hashes are then paired together. Hash A and hash B are combined to create a new hash, hash hash A plus hash B, which we call hash AB, and the same is done for transactions C and D to get hash CD. Moving up the tree, these hashes are paired again, and we combine hash AB with hash CD. The resulting hash is what we call the Merkle root, represented here as hash ABCD. This Merkle root is a single hash that uniquely represents all transactions in the block. Now here's where the efficiency of SPV comes into play. When a user wants to confirm a particular transaction, the SPV system only needs to follow the branch of the tree that contains the transaction of interest. This is done by verifying the associated hashes of the transactions linking them back to the Merkle root of the block they're in. This method ensures that the transaction is part of a block in the longest chain, considered the valid chain. This process is efficient and allows users on devices with less capacity to securely verify that their transactions are included in the blockchain. For example, if you want to verify that transaction A is indeed part of the block, you don't need the whole tree. You just need hash B and hash CD to combine with your hash A. Through a process known as recursive hashing, you can verify the transactions by calculating upwards until you reach the Merkle root. If your calculated Merkle root matches the one in the blockchain, you can confirm that the transaction is valid and included in the block. This is how SPV simplifies the verification process, enabling users to securely validate transactions with minimal data, a critical innovation for making blockchain accessible on mobile devices and other platforms with limited storage. In contrast, a full node which might be running on a desktop with ample storage would track and validate the transaction all the way back to the Genesis block, the very first block on the blockchain. Let's explore some key takeaways from this discussion. Let's revisit the early history of digital currencies and how Bitcoin revolutionized the field. 
Before Bitcoin, there were early digital currency initiatives. David Chaum, who was involved with the cypherpunk movement, introduced DigiCash. However, it ran into the double spend problem. It attempted to tackle this issue by partnering with banks. The endeavor ultimately failed. The approach was neither decentralized nor in line with the cypherpunk's ethos. Bitcoin, introduced in 2008 by the mysterious Satoshi Nakamoto, addressed the double spend problem without requiring a central authority. Leveraging the proof of work protocol, Bitcoin confirms transactions in a decentralized manner approximately every 10 minutes. It is also important to understand that there are no coins in Bitcoin, neither virtual nor physical. Instead, a person's balance is determined by summing up their transaction history associated with a specific wallet. We refer to a person's Bitcoin holdings as a balance derived from transactions in and out of a wallet. Think of it as an ongoing audit trail, where the net balance reflects all previous transactions. In Bitcoin, there is no central server. Instead, it is a decentralized ledger. Operating peer-to-peer, -peer, similar to Napster or BitTorrent. Lastly, there are no spreadsheets. Bitcoin structures data in a sequential chain of blocks. Miners are integral to the network as they validate and append new blocks to the chain, but a block is only added if it gains acceptance from at least 51% of the network. Within the Bitcoin blockchain, transactions are organized into blocks, with each block cryptographically linked to the previous block. This type of organization protects the data integrity of the ledger, making it tamper resistant. Bitcoin uses the SHA-256 hashing algorithm. It should be clear, however, that cryptographic hashing is not unique to Bitcoin. Instead, it has long been the standard for verifying the integrity of open source software, such as Audacity, ensuring that what you download has not been hacked. Lastly, the Simplified Payment Verification, or SPV, leverages the mathematical properties of recursive hashing and the Merkle root to enable verification on mobile devices. That's a wrap. This completes this installment of this series. Join us again next time when you need a change of scenery, and a little caffeine, of course. <laughs>